It's outpacing inflation by an incredibly large margin. So um, and pretty soon it'll be one Bitcoin to buy that same house and then half a Bitcoin to buy that same house because Bitcoin's going to a million, five million dollars when priced in U.S. Mm -hmm. dollars. Look, at my life priced in Bitcoin, you know, I bought several properties. I'm living large here in El Salvador based on my cost basis for Bitcoin. The entire 24 months I've been here has cost me seven dollars and 50 cents. <laughs> the seven dollars and 50 cents that I used to buy Bitcoin, you know, back in 2011 now is worth you know, millions of dollars. So uh, it's actually cost me nothing. I'm living for free. I can buy shit for nothing. I can buy whole buildings for practically nothing because my Bitcoin cost basis is, you know, under $10. You know, keep printing money. I don't give a shit because you're just making my Bitcoin go higher. And that's going to be true for everybody. And that, you're not too late to buy Bitcoin. You're buying it at $70,000 of Bitcoin. Well, it's going to 700000 Meanwhile, you're uh, fiat money is going to zero. So if you own any fiat money, it's going to zero against Bitcoin. So you might as well just buy Bitcoin, just suck it up and buy Bitcoin because it's going higher. Now, is there volatility? Sure, there's volatility, but there's guaranteed increase in purchasing power over time. You can keep yourself in dollars and there won't be any volatility and you're guaranteed to lose purchasing power. The choice is yours. Max Kaiser shares his personal journey showcasing how Bitcoin has outpaced inflation by a significant margin, transforming his initial investment into a fortune that allows him to live, quite literally, for almost nothing in El Salvador. This incredible growth trajectory of Bitcoin, from being worth enough to buy a few pizzas to potentially reaching a million dollars per coin, paints a vivid picture of its value not just as a digital asset, but as a lifeline in an economy where traditional currency continues to lose its purchasing power. As Max puts it, we're not too late to the Bitcoin party. Despite its volatility, Bitcoin offers a guaranteed increase in purchasing power over time, contrasting sharply with the guaranteed loss in purchasing power of fiat money. Before we dive deeper, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and like this video to stay updated on all things crypto. You know, there's a big difference between a Bitcoin accumulator and a trader, a stock trader. Now, if, I, if I'm a stock trader or if I was managing a portfolio of stocks, there is a general rule to sell your losers and buy your winners, keep adding to your winners. And this is generally not practiced by most people who trade stocks. Most people trade their winners to offset the fact that they have some losers. And this is results in mediocre results over years, but nobody can seem to resist the temptation to sell their winners to pay off their losers because the psychology of losing is a lot more damaging than the psychology of winning. Most people, when they have a winning stock or a winning bet, they have a bit of an endorphine rush when, versus when they have a loss. It's generally an emotional event that some people get addicted to. Well, you see that this base, the basis of the casino industry is people addicted to losing money. And people who sometimes, as a stockbroker on Wall Street, you would meet a lot of people like that who actually like to lose money. They feel guilty that they have money and they come to you to seek their ability of you to take their money from them in through the stock market losses that they can then justify as having had a legitimate possibility of making money, but they lost money, but they feel better because they cleanse themselves of that dirty money, right? There's a lot of psychology that goes on around money, but with Bitcoin, there is never a bad time to buy Bitcoin and you would never sell Bitcoin because it's not a trade you're swapping worthless fiat shit for the perfect money. And it is money. It's the money that will be the basis of the future of the entire global economy. So there is no reason to sell it ever. And I'll give a great, a great personal example. So when I got into the Bitcoin space five years ago, I did the, made the mistake of a lot of people and people said, oh, buy these crypto, these shit coins. Yeah. And, I, and I said, okay, okay. So it was a little over a year ago when the Bitcoin price was like at 19,000 and I still had some of these dumb shit coins. And you know what I did? I converted a lot of them to Bitcoin. Right. Because I went with the, what you're talking about. I said, so I'm at, I'm at a loss right now, but eventually when converting them to Bitcoin, I will get this money back that I wasted on these dumb yeah, shit coins. Totally. I will get it back. Yeah, definitely. And it was like, and, and, and I was trying to, and some people were like, wow, well, I go, no, no, no. Yeah. Over time, I know Bitcoin's going to 100,000, 200, 500. I know that's going to happen. Yeah. So whatever loss I had from this dumb shit coin, yeah. I will get that back and then some. Yeah. And I really, 
I mean, you, you really, you, you and Stacy really helped me understand. And then listening to the Michael Saylor, like, yeah, yeah, of course. just keep buying, don't sell your Bitcoin. Obviously you, if you're using Bitcoin, like in a circular economy, like here, that's, that's fine to use yeah. a little bit of it, or you get paid in fiat, you convert it to Bitcoin to, to spend in a circular economy, but yeah. the bulk of it stack that shit. That's just, that's what I've been doing. And now I don't feel now that Bitcoin of course has made a year later, 14 yeah. months later is yeah. hitting all time highs. Right. I've got my money back from those dumb shit coins. Right. Cause my Bitcoin has gone up. Yeah. Because your conviction goes up, the more you know about yeah. it, the more you educate yourself, Michael Saylor is an excellent teacher and a guy who gives people great advice and great insight into Bitcoin. And your conviction goes up and you end up buying more. When your conviction is low and you don't really know much about it, you end up selling. These ETF buyers, for example, there's a lot of outflow from the ETFs. There were nine ETFs that mm -hmm. were approved. They attracted billions of dollars. And at the time I said, well, these are not, these are not Bitcoiners. These are people who got a call from their broker who said that, oh, by the way, there's something called Bitcoin. It's in an ETF now. Why don't you put 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars into it? And so they put a few dollars into right. it without thinking about it. They know nothing about Bitcoin and they don't know much about ETFs either. But it's on the desk and on the to do list of 100,000 brokers and who were looking at their list of calls to make and they simply slip it into people's accounts and they get a commission and they don't think much about it. But then the second that's down 5%, we had a 10 or 15 percent drawdown in bitcoin right so that triggered a lot of automatic sales a lot of people who just have sell orders put underneath the price that they pay to get out 10 percent below that's something traders do that's something that stock investors would do so they got stopped out they got traded out they got sold out and then that creates more sell orders and then you get a 15 percent down suddenly and they're they're not in it for because they understand it. They're just in it because it's the stock du jour. That's Nvidia right. of its day. Nvidia is the bubble of today, and um, so people buy it and they're momentum traders, as they're called. And uh, but they they just dump it. So ETF buyers are going to be jerking themselves off with ETFs for 10, 20 years, and they'll probably never make any money on Bitcoin because they're, they're, they have no understanding of Bitcoin. They don't know why they own Bitcoin. They're just going to be momentum traders up and down, sideways, doing commissions, being a jerk, and they don't know anything about it. They'll, But so that's the situation with this ETF market. However, it is a large pool of money, so it does benefit Bitcoin in that they are bringing in a big, big pool of capital. But it's not going to mean the volatility is going to go away. There's still going to be a volatile asset. Yeah. And, and and now that you have these stupid, dumb money retail investors and ETFs, that's uh, is going to uh, not make the volatility go away. It's going to, right. the volatility is going to continue to be volatile. Max Kaiser points out a critical distinction. While stock traders operate under the principle of selling losers and buying winners, Bitcoin accumulators understand that there's never a bad time to buy Bitcoin. This perspective underscores Bitcoin not as a mere trade, but as the exchange of worthless fiat for what many consider perfect money. The anecdote of transitioning from speculative altcoins to Bitcoin not only highlights the importance of making informed choices, but also the significance of belief in Bitcoin's future, as individuals like Michael Saylor offer insights into Bitcoin's potential. We see a growing conviction that leads to increased investment in Bitcoin, despite the volatility and the perceived risks. It's not about quick wins or compensating for losses. It's about understanding and participating in a financial revolution that promises long-term stability and growth. As we explore the volatility and challenges ahead, remember, the journey with Bitcoin is as much about belief in its future as it is about the financial gains. At a certain income level, happiness quotient disappears. You said 150,000. The last time I looked at those numbers, it was around 40,000. So obviously inflation has, has impacted <laughs> the minimum happiness quotient on money. But the point is that the amount of money you have or the income that you have to cover basics and to do some stuff. Once you achieve that, it's, it, it, it's uh, difficult to get happier with more money. And, and um, most in uh, having been in the money management world myself for many years, most people with a lot of money have no idea even how much money they have. So if somebody has, let's say 30 million, or 35 million or 50 million. They literally have no idea what they actually have. Um, or they'll find an account with $20 million in it that they didn't know. Um, this happens all the time. Uh, people die all the time and they find accounts with millions and millions and millions of dollars. Like most people with a lot of money 
really it's just stagnant somewhere and being ignored and it's not really recycling in the economy at all no one's doing anything with it because as to your point there's nothing really you can do it you know more money more problems like when you start to spend money when you start to invest money it creates a paper trail you need people to handle that paper trail you need to hire accountants to handle that paper trail and it gets more complicated and you spend your day pushing paper like you have to managing if you have a lot of money you're managing your money it's like a full-time job and you know the point of being wealthy is not to have a full-time job but it, you know if you so number one number two is um you get you attract a lot of um attention yeah. um from from people who have a very strong opinion about the fact that you have a lot of money right. and so now you're kind of dealing with people in a way that's uncomfortable that you would prefer not to, you know, you'd prefer just to be kind of anonymous, really. You don't want to be just like constantly talking to people about the fact that you've got a lot of money. And right, so right. therefore, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? And these people are starving and this is happening here and this is going on. You should do stuff. You know, the, uh, you know, I think people should have the right to, to not do anything, you know, sure. like the, I should, nobody should be able to have to do anything if they don't want to do anything. I mean, that's the most environmentally sound thing you possibly could do. Mm -hmm. My carbon footprint could be zero if I'm just sitting on the beach doing nothing. My carbon footprint is zero. Okay. How about that? I'm going to help you the ecology by doing nothing. How about that? I'm not going to get on a jet. I'm not going to take a meeting. I'm not going to fill out a form. I'm just going to sit here and I can do absolutely jack shit. I'm not going to do anything. My carbon footprint is zero, except for maybe, you know, the bananas I'm eating might generate a little, you know, excess carbon into the atmosphere. Other the than daiquiri that, carbon. The you, know, daiquiri like carbon. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's my contribution. Despite popular belief, there comes a point where additional income or wealth does not equate to increased happiness. This insight, coupled with the realities of managing significant wealth, brings us to question the very nature of money and its role in our lives. Bitcoin in this context emerges not just as a financial asset, but as a philosophical choice. It represents a shift towards a more conscious and environmentally sustainable way of living, where doing absolutely jack can be the most impactful action one takes. The journey with Bitcoin is not just about the financial returns. It's about embracing a new paradigm that values sustainability, autonomy, and the intrinsic happiness derived from simplicity. Join us on Unscripted Crypto as we continue to explore the evolving landscape of cryptocurrency and its potential to reshape our world. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you found these insights valuable.